All right, everybody, welcome to the uh, last effective exam series. Part three is this a trick question. Um, in, in swimming, a, a championship meet, we um, it's a series of like three days swimming at least in the morning, your three events, and then if you qualify in your afternoon, the same three events if you're, if you're good. And so you get to the last day the last race, the last heat, and you always go last one, fast one. <laughs> and so that's exactly what, what I've been thinking about. So we're going to roll through this, um, and um, I look forward to it. Um, we are going to spend a minute covering webinar etiquette just to make sure everybody is on the same page. Then we're going to jump straight into completion and fill in the blank test items. Um, whoopsie. Sorry about that. Sticky finger. Oh, no, I'm doing I'm, I'm on a web conference. Sorry. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, writing essay items. I, I just actually omitted the grading piece of it. Um, just because I, to be honest with you, I didn't think it would be very helpful. Um, again, this is in a document that will be located on our site. I think I've already put it there. So um, you'll see this and very much more um, on that document, and I recommend you go take a visit. Um, and then we're going to spend just a short time talking about different types of test items, including problem solving and authentic assessment. So. Real quick, just so we understand the rules of webinar etiquette, is we want to be on time and test all of your equipment in advance. Um, and then you definitely want to mute your audio when you are not speaking. Um, this allows for other distracting noises to not interfere with what is happening in the webinar. Um, you can have the chat box open if you would like and chat away. That's, um, that's a good way to do it. Um, pay attention, of course, just like we would ask all of our students. And then ask any questions that you have at any time in the chat or, you know, jump in on the microphone if it's pertinent to that time. We definitely want to encourage um, talking. We just want to discourage noise interruptions. So let's talk about completion test items, otherwise known as fill in the blanks. Completion items are really useful in assessing mastery of factual information, especially when there's a specific word or phrase that's important for your students to know. Um, they help minimize guessing um, as opposed to your multiple limited choice items since they require a definite response rather than just like a simple recognition of the word, especially if you don't provide a word bank. Um, and that actually would be then almost a multiple choice type of question. Um, because a short answer is required, their use on a test can enable a wide sampling of content. So you, you can get a lot of um, anal data for, for an analysis. Now, you can only kind of assess rote repetitive responses um, or you don't, you can only, but it, it really tend to only test that, that knowledge lower level uh, of Bloom's ta taxonomy. Um, and studying for that may cause your students to have sort of fragmented uh, st study style if they know, you know, assuming which words they're going to be replaced and then get them all confused. Um, they are a little more difficult to score than forced choice because you've got to make sure, you know, not more than one answer is, is ha, there, there's not more than one answer. Um, so that can also be a time consuming process. There are kind of questions here about what, whether, um, what are completion items versus short answer. Um, as you can see on the screen, completion is only one to two words, whereas a, a short answer response requires a sentence or paragraph. Um, the completion, because you're limited to the amount of words that you're answering with, um, they're just better for recall or memorization of facts. Short answer allows a little bit more explanation to ensue. 
Um, completion can be more objective than short answer when, when scoring, just because you're only identifying those one to two words. But again, you have to be careful that your answer doesn't allow for other answers that would be just as correct than the one that you intended. Um, whereas short answer, there is some teacher judgment going on while we're, while we're grading those. Does anybody have any questions? I don't think I've used the, the completion format in the past. I've used short answer quite a bit, but completion mm -hmm. not so much. Well, I would think that your um, subject matter would lend towards that design. Right. All I right. use a lot of the completion. Um, even though I call it short answer, I'm like, it's really short. It's like a word. Calm down, everybody. <laughs> but but um, I do find that it works really well in in-seat paper quizzes and tests, but online, if you want them to say bacteria and they say the bacteria, it freaks out for self-grading you know, it yep. on the online right. quizzes. So that's something I've had to be more careful about is putting any way I could possibly think to write it for the possible answers and then going back and doing it by hand anyway. So, <laughs> that is a really fast. good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. All right. I think I have a, a game next. What do we have going on here? Oh, yes. All right. So on the next three slides, you're going to be given a fill-in-the-blank statement about completion test items, tips and tricks, just general knowledge about them. And then we're just going to, um, you can answer out loud. Just We'll just discuss the answers together. So the first one. A fill-in-the-blank question asks students to supply rather than blank the answer. Identify. Anybody else? Choose. Choose. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? I agree with them. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what the survey says. Select. So we're talking, and that is choosing to, right. you know, the select and supply. We either they either are supplying us the answer, or they're selecting from the ones that we have replied or have supplied them. All right, make the blank of equal length. Selections. Anyone else? I'm not saying you're wrong, Tom. I really don't know the answer. Oh, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click. <laughs> I'm just trying to get some participation. <laughs> I feel like I need more information, Ellen. Make oh. <laughs> more information. All right. The answer is make the. Oh. oh okay. okay. Make the blank. Of equal length. Yeah, make the blanks of equal length. <laughs> All right. Last one. The main problem in constructing completion items is to limit the number of possible answers there Correct. you go so, so, yeah somebody I'm the, I'm the king of trouble there <laughs> <laughs> oh, <woo. laughs> somebody's been paying attention all right so let's learn a little bit more about these guys um, you want to omit only significant words from the statement so as you can see there um, Every atom has a central blank called a nucleus, which I misspelled. That's the second time that's happened. Um, one out of three on typos in my webinars. I apologize. <laughs> um, versus the, the desirable one there, where you're really testing that, that piece of knowledge that you want to know if they know or not. Avoid obvious clues to the correct response. Um, and this goes as far as kind of your plurals um, and, and you, the use of those uh, articles, a, and, and, so those types of things you want to keep in mind. I get it, Ellen. You can't give, you can't give the first letter of the word, huh? That's right. No, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess you could. No. Um, it, 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 <laughs> be defeating the purpose. So be sure there is only one correct response. So I'll let you look at that. Trees which shed their leaves annually are, you know, there's a billion things that could be. 
versus trees which shed their leaves are annually are called. Um, and I think this is we're gonna this is gonna pop up here later, but it's really about drilling down with your sentence structure to make sure you're getting the knowledge out of the student that you are wanting to assess. I got that. It's angiosperms. <laughs> 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 All right, so let's look at these. What's wrong with number one? That's too many. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely correct. Do not omit. Oh, <laughs> Do not omit so many words from the statement that the intended meaning is lost. All right, what about number two? <laughs> October fest. Right answer. <laughs> Just kidding. Right? Like there's so many options that could be correct. Oh. That's interesting. I thought that was interesting too. Hmm. And and um why is that? I wonder. Yeah, I mean, you get you get some context early on, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually wondering about like the layout of the page, and you know, like people can misinterpret T's and F's and true and false. Is is the two in front of like I've been, I've been thinking about this one for a while. Oh. <laughs> All right, what's next? Oh yeah, how about this one? We need to be aware of clever students. <laughs> How do you know what state means? Yeah. Exactly. And what are the states then? Yeah. Nudity, infancy, and bliss can all oh, be yeah. answers. <laughs> Confusion, yeah. <laughs> Denial. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so moving right along, we've got essay tests. Now, here we are going to have a poll um, in this little section. It's coming up here in a little bit. And we're going to talk about extended response or, um, that shouldn't say short answer. Oh, yeah, like our shorter answer responses. So essay tests present usually kind of a realistic task to the student um, where they are required to organize and communicate their thoughts rather than just respond um, to questions being asked. Um, your, your students are able to demonstrate a high, higher level achievement, such as analyzing and, and critical thinking, up there in the top level of blooms. And it offers them the opportunity to use their, their judgment and their writing styles and vocabularies, which those in its own self, even taken out of your content area, are applicable to other people's content area. So those skills are really important to develop. Um, they are less time consuming to prepare. Now that's not talking about thinking of the and putting the actual questions together, but like just typing them out. It's, it's a lot, in my opinion, a lot quicker to type out a paragraph than a whole bunch of multiple choice questions. Oh yeah. The, the dread is grading them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, it's funny that you say that cause I did take that part off, but I will elaborate on what the, what the, um, resource says when they get there. Um, to me, it just sounded like a lot of extra time rather than just sitting down and grading the, the daggone things. Um, the bad side of, of essay items is yes, they are very time consuming. Um, they are very subjectively graded unless you have kind of a rubric um, mm -hmm. or a perfect example. Um, and then there's only so many of those types of questions you can ask in the given time that you all have. So reliability or validity may, may be decreased a little bit. All right, so here's the quiz. Now this one, this one in, in the spirit of doing program review and assessment and, and me loving objectives, um, you are going to choose the letter of the learning level that is best indicated by the words in the given statements. Now these are all types of words that you may use in your SA question to the student. Okay? And there's six of them. Um, I'm going to give you about three minutes. That's about 30 seconds apiece, maybe 3.30 because there might be some you want to think about. Everybody ready? Yep. Okie dokie. Can you see it? 
Yep. All right. All right, I'm going to close it in 10 seconds. All right, let's share. All right, I, essay items that begin with modify, prepare, or solve. And that, in my mind, um, was synthesis, according to my Bloom's taxonomy verb list. They didn't give me the answers. I had to go look these up myself. Mm. Um, but we can discuss it. That doesn't mean I'm right. I'm only looking at the verb list. <laughs> Well, if it's on the verb list, I mean, that, that, that's indicative, but uh, that was one I kind of, because you're not creating something, because the, you know, we're talking about the synthesis, you know, 
taking something that's you know known and putting it into a combination. Oh, we need to mute ourselves, please. Um, mute if you have a dog barking. There we go. Um, then at number two, essay items that begin with define, label, outline, or state, and that's exactly correct. Knowledge. Way to go, team. Essay items may begin with convert, predict, or estimate. Oh, that's, um, that for me, that's evaluation is what I went with on that one. Oh, no. What what does the math math teacher think here? That's kind of um I would have thought knowledge. Analysis. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Yep. Um analysis. They don't yep, those are pretty that. specific words. Um they don't have those on the Bloom's list. Um essay items may begin with appraise, interpret, or criticize. Now, I, I agree with both choices. However, I would have chosen evaluation because of this. In order to evaluate, you have to analyze first. So that would just be a step along the way. Anybody have any comments on that? Nope. OK. Essay items may begin with categorize, compile, or rearrange. Comprehension. Mm -hmm. I, had, I thought application. Well, you know it, that I I think so too. Um, but what would you be applying? Uh, I was trying to think of an example. I can see how that would be debatable, but I'm I'm trying to think of an example of where, like, when you categorize something, when you're doing the act of placing things. What you're Wait. doing is understanding the characteristics of those things. So to me, that's comprehension. Well, and I'm a little, like, there's, there's a revised list of Bloom's taxonomy that uses some different verbiage. So, like, I get, you know, that application term kind of resonated with what I saw on the, the other list. So yeah, that well, and that's the other thing. I was pretty disappointed that um, this resource had old Bloom's taxonomy verbs, but the rest of it is really good. Yeah, it's all cool. <laughs> that's funny you pointed that out because that's bugged me. Um, essay items may begin with diagram, illustrate, or separate. I definitely think that's synthesis. You have to synthesize information in order to do any of those things. Well, you, and you're cre once again, that goes with you're creating yeah. something, you know, out of it. Exactly. All right. So can you just see the screen now? The poll's gone? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. All right. So here are some general um, hints and tri tips and tricks on writing essay test items. So clarity. Again, we talked about that earlier. You want to make sure you aim the student to the approach you want them to take. Um, words like discuss and explain can be really ambiguous. Um, so you want to provide specific instructions after those. For example, discuss Karl Marx's philosophy. Well, I mean, one could write for days mm -hmm. on that particular topic. So um, you may want to choose a different word like compare marks and so-and-so. Um, and and how I, that's about as good as I can go. I had philosophy a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, in order to obtain a broader sampling of course content, um, if you use, you know, if you use a large number of questions requiring shorter answers rather than just a few questions involving, you know, two to three page answers, you can kind of span the, the scope of your content that you're assessing. Um, I found this really interesting, optional questions. They said, avoid the use of optional essay questions, and, and this is why. If there are five essay questions and students are told to answer any three of them, then there are 10 different tests possible. So then it makes it difficult to discriminate um, between the student who could respond correctly to all five or the student who could only answer three. 
Hmm. Um, and I thought that was interesting. I have taken many tests where um, I was given a choice. I mean, as a matter of fact, my philosophy, the, the last philosophy I had test I had was in like 1990. <laughs> and I had to choose eight out of the 10. Um, well, but I don't see anything wrong with that, Ellen. Because, and I do it. I do it on my test a lot. And I mean, the, the high level students are going to probably know if you, if you say answer three out of five or two out of five, the, the high level students are going to know all five. Well, even at that, though, you might know it, but, you know, having choice to me gives you the sense of which do you think you know the best. And, you know, th that's just been experiential that choice has always been something that's been uh, useful. Well, I mean, I, I had a whole list of questions when I, when I, um, prepare these PowerPoints. I put questions that I have, and, and, and my question was, can you think of a time when optional questions would be appropriate? And, you know, the student choice empowers them, and, and that that's kind of a, a that, that goes under student motivation, and I get it. Um, uh, again, with the, the smartest kids are going to know all five of them anyway. My question there is, well, then your non-smart kids still make may get a hundred percent on the test because they answered the three that they actually knew correctly. So how do you, how do you, well, deal is, with that that? A, is that, is that a problem? I mean, because hopefully on the optional things you have for short answers, you've covered the core material with, with your, some other format. And by the time you get to the short answer kind of things, it should be, this is like interpretive to some degree. Um, you know, and if they've, they've, they've like worked hard to say, I'm going to choose these three, I'm going to nail them, then why shouldn't they get full credit? Right. No, I agree. But what I'm saying is, is what if they didn't have a clue on the other two? Um, you never know. Right. But, but, but is, that's why, is that knowledge that needs to be assessed? And if it isn't, why is it on the exam? Like, that's, yeah. the, that's the piece I'm trying to reconcile. Yeah, and, and not, to, not to beat a dead horse on this, but I think if you're going to do that kind of thing, it should be more about perspectives than different questions right, altogether. Right, right, you know, right. Having se yeah, several choices, which is like using different perspectives to answer right. the same basic question, that would be a good reason to do that. Yes, okay. That, then, then you took care of my question after this one. Can you think of a time when optional questions would be appropriate? Yeah, and like you, that. You, yeah, that's perfect. All right, levels of learning. Um, you want to write essay items at different levels of learning, some that uh, – I mean, the goal is to write essay items that measure higher cognitive processes, um, and you want to make sure you use those verbs um, to, to get them there, but you don't want to stick them there the whole time. I think what they were saying is, is build them up to, you know, if you want to build them up to a particular level, to scaffold your, your questioning. Um, now, there are two types of scoring models. Um, one is analytic. In analytic, you prepare an ideal answer um, in which major components are defined and assigned point values, and then you read and compare the student's answers with the model answer. Holistic, then, is more of you're considering the student's answer as a whole and kind of the rubric base um, and judging the quality of the answer relative to other students' responses or the quality of your rubric. Um, which one, when you all grade kind of essay exams, how do you how do you score? What 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 is your scoring criteria or method? Oh, mine's probably analytic. anybody, anybody else? I think I write my essay, if it's anything like an essay, it's usually not very long, but I write it with the intention that there are certain words or phrases I expect to see potentially in a certain order, if it's a, you know, if it's an explanation of a process. Um, and that kind of gives a little bit of wiggle room for them, but if they're saying, you know, kind of the right words at the right places together, then they usually get the points. Because some people right. can what you know can express themselves really clearly, and some people are panicking. And so, if they've gotten the right terms from the question, 
in an order, then it's probably, they've got it. They could explain it if it weren't panic on an exam, you know. Right, right. So, the, the, go ahead. No, I'm just saying in my upper level courses, uh, like ecology, I, I, I go real heavy on the essay because what I'm looking for on that level is sequential thought to get to an organized answer. And, and, and I, that's hard to do in general biology because there's so many. Right. right. That, yeah. I was just sitting there thinking that was kind of blowing my brains out. <laughs> Higher level ecology. Um, well, you can bless those students' hearts. <laughs> <laughs> so the last suggestion they had is make sure you prepare students to take essay exams. Do you guys do that? Yeah, I think to a degree. Yeah, I do. We had one on a recent um, test that we did. I'm trying to think specifically, but I said, well, you know, there's going to be a short answer thing on here, and I want you to think about this this question. And I kind of threw it out there. And so they had time to percolate on it. So what do we got? Preparation? Prepare students? Uh-huh. Yeah. So. All right. So, I'll, I'll, Ellen, I'll blow your mind again, okay? All right. I can't all right, wait. All right. <laughs> so, so in my ecology class, I openly tell them, listen, these are juniors and seniors that are about ready to probably go to graduate school. So I tell them openly that I, I'm teaching it right there at the threshold level. So if you go into graduate school, you've got a real good chance of doing good. Now, that being said, I will ask a question and then give them an, an organized answer that I've given to that problem so that they see the level of my expectation. Well, now, that is an incredible and probably one of the best strategies a, 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 an instructor can do. And I know this because about 50 pages of my lit review in my dissertation was on work examples and how, um, how people learn from worked examples. And people learn best from worked examples when they're provided the experts way to work it. Mm. And um, that, is that somewhat, is that somewhat like modeling? Yes, I mean, yeah. it's absolutely modeling, um, just with different terminology. Right. That's, that's exactly what that, that part was. So, John. Okay, I said to the bar. Yeah, yeah, right. you did. You blew my mind, man. You just tapped into my dissertation, and you don't even know what it's on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what's next. Uh, we're going to talk about... Um, a couple of different other types of test items, problem solving and authentic assessment. And I've got some people on line with me who do a lot of problem solving and a lot of authentic assessment. So let's see what they have to say. Um, now, problem solving is can be a, a subjective um, assessment piece minus the types of problems you solve in the sciences and, and maths. Um, but it is, um, requires somebody to demonstrate work procedures or a task. Um, you can assign partial credit or full credit. How do you all handle that? Handle what? Partial credit or full credit on like problem solving tasks so if they work the problem all the way through and then I think you'd, for me I'd have to have some sense of a, a, a mild rubric to say it you know you achieve this much this much or this much and that would dictate point value right right that's 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 good um, these do take an extensive amount of time to read and grade um, you got to be careful with score or bias when partial credit is given um, but Tom's suggestion of rubric takes that bullet completely off the page. <laughs> All righty. So when designing um, problem solving uh, test items, uh, you want to make sure you're very clear in your directions, um, whether they need to show all of the work procedures for full or partial credit. You need to lay that all out there. Um, you want to ask 
the questions should be asked, um, uh, ask questions on which experts could agree that one solution and one or more work procedures are better than others. So, you know, in the spirit of there's more than one way to work a problem kind of thing, um, accuracy, this is, I was a math teacher for 20 years and this kicked my tail a couple of times. Um, and, hold on, I got to respond back. I'm not. Sue, so I'm not hearing you when you're trying to contribute, and I was wondering where you were, but you're unmuted. Yeah. There, there you is. are. <laughs> there you are. Yay. Hi, Sue. I've, I've been going a little bit crazy. It's okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, the good thing is you didn't hear the dogs barking earlier then. <laughs> uh, we kind of did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we can have both <laughs> You know, Alan, you know, when I when I see their problem solving, it, it makes me remember when I went through physics and, and, and probably the most important thing at physics was it teaches you kind of how to logically put two and two together to make four to get right answers. So, so I love the idea of maybe putting four or five different um, formulas together to get to an answer. Right, right, That's right. That's the beauty for me. Yes, yes. But you want to make sure that you work through each problem <laughs> before the te the key gets out and you grade the test incorrectly. Have, have you all experienced that before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> now, I, I don't think I agree with this expertise thing there. Well, what is, the, tell me why. Well, I mean, a solution is a solution. Right. And uh, it, it's, if it's, justifiable and if they all the steps are there if they and students frequently work a problem in a, uh, a way I didn't anticipate and it's perfectly correct so I make sure I point that out when I'm handing tests back say saying oh so and so had a had a, a really different way to approach this problem which was good and I'll, I'll say it but uh, uh, and I love that because the, the thing too. is, you know, that we may see it in one way and, and they take me to a path that I never thought about going to. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and, and they get it. Yeah. And that would be why we teach is to continue to learn. Oh, just warming my heart. Um, <laughs> the other thing I was thinking about, Joel, with your statement is I remember sitting in my Algebra 1 class and we were doing some sort of factoring and I, I got to the answer and what my teacher said to me, pulled me up in front of the class and said, you didn't go the wrong way, you just went the long way <laughs> at the end of that problem. Yeah. All righty, so here's some suggestions. Provide directions which inform the students of the type of response that, is, that you want. So again, drilling down to make sure they know exactly what to answer. That's kind of been our theme tonight. I'm not sure if anybody noticed throughout the, the, the presentation, but it's all about making sure we're communicating um, through our exams exactly what we want the students to know. Separate item parts and indicate their point values. I always found this very helpful as a student. Um, do you all do practices as such? Yes. Yeah. Anybody, not really. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that really um, and that that's a unwritten kind of communication to your students about you know, are these equally as important, you know, is this more important, that sort of thing. Um, now we're going to work on into authentic assessment. And that's where um, the difference between problem solving or any other types of tests that we've talked about the last two weeks or three weeks now um, is authentic assessment is more about the process, the learning process, as much as the finished product. Um, and there's some examples up there. I think our education people are just chock full of authentic assessment Yep. Um, because there's never the same day twice 
in the world of education. <laughs> so it's got to be pretty authentic. So authentic assessments can measure objectives related to the ability of the real world you know, in context. Um, they provide a degree of validity not possible with just your standard paper or pencil items. You know, they either authentically do the task that you've been given or they don't. Um, it's useful for measuring objectives in the psychomotor domain, which is a little bit different than, um, you know, Bloom's taxonomy. It's got kind of a different slant to it, but I still think um, authentic assessments. To be honest with you, the research I've done on um, cheating, uh, especially in the online classroom, this was this was ex one of the suggestions I gave to the SACS presentation in December, was if you really want to avert, uh, avert uh, cheating in the online classroom, then do authentic assessments because they're theirs and they have to turn that in. Mm -hmm. um, Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Now, good Lord, what does this mean? Useful for measuring objectives in a psychomotor domain? So psychomotor yeah. domain is the knowledge you have to be able to, to, to physically do something either with, um, it's more of an act. So like discuss. Discuss is not a psychomotor domain. You're, you're sitting there talking. <laughs> So it would be the verbs that um, where you're doing things, um, you know, creating a portfolio of your artwork or creating, um, you know, authentic assessment would be your research projects, John. Okay. okay. You see what I'm saying? Like, uh -huh. that's a little bit different than identifying whatever it is that you guys do Good. down at that creek. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and, and Ellen? Ellen, yes. Add, let me add yeah. to that for a sec. Um, one of the things about doing action research, which is a, a, it's a legitimate research approach in the field of education, is that you're anchoring your research to an, a, a problem of practice within your school. And the rules of the game actually allow you to use the evidence that you find at the end of your research to make suggestions for improving practice. That, that to me, is the real heart of authentic assessment. Yes, with, um, I'm going to agree with you 100%. So that's what psychomotor is, John. Does that answer your question yeah. where you're, like, actually yeah. doing something? No, it's too complex for me. I'm going to have to look up – I'm going to have to look up the definition of psychomotor. Oh, how about I send you some stuff? <laughs> He's just messing with us. I know. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not no, no, I'm no, not. I got, I got you, John. I'll, uh, you know what? You'll have an email in the morning. Okay. Be very careful what you wish for. <laughs> hey, Ellen. Yes. Ellen, can yes. I toss out like a quick example of something I did that yes. might clarify it? It's just, like, it's a simple thing. It's a, it's a 103 class, yeah. and it was about interviewing you know, we've gone through all this work this th throughout the, the semester, and I said, based on what we've studied in the text, I want you to do an interview with an existing teacher, and I want you to compose seven questions that reflect what we've done in the text, but also that you want to know about in that context with that, you know, th that teacher's experience, because yeah. that's what you're going to be. So then they reported on that, right? They created a presentation, reported on what they found. To me, that was an authentic assessment. It absolutely is. That, that whole going out and them doing the thing to be able to show you that they've learned something. That's as Sue the said, psychomotor part. Right. And as Sue said, though, it's contextually grounded. So right. they, they sort of own it. They own it. Yeah. Now, designing these suckers are hmm. difficult and time-consuming. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> um, and then you, you don't... This, they're used for testing students individually. These these aren't necessarily what you would consider group projects. However, um, they can become that. Uh, you just have to make sure you're assessing all pieces for all people. Well, and they, they, they kind of step outside of the boundaries of what we consider to be a traditional test in that sense. Exactly. And I think part of the reason for that is um, while you can have a rubric, there is still 
a subjective approach you have to take. Um, somebody can check off all the boxes teaching and, and pre-service teaching, but that doesn't necessarily, and so that means they know everything, but that doesn't mean that they're doing it actually correct. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and, uh, and that's why we work on establishing what we call intercoder agreement. Yeah. Or, you know, because you, you have to talk about what it is that you're really getting at, and you have to come to consensus. Right. That's an excellent like, point. That's an so. excellent point. Okay, so um, this is when you want to use these guys, performance tests, um, short investigations, open response, uh, or portfolios where you document learning over time, all of which I have seen on Midway's campus. So we're, we're doing that, and I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So that's it, folks.